not only are billionaires like Ray Dalio, who is one of the top wealthiest people in the world, well, they're planning for and preparing for the next visible crisis, but so are global central banks who, as we know, are not only accumulating record amounts of gold, but the trend that began in 2008 of gold repatriation, taking gold home, that's been escalating very dramatically just lately. Today, I'm going to show you how and why central banks are planning not only for the visible crisis, but also a complete financial reset. All that and more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and, dare I even say it, thrive through the crisis that will be making itself visible at some point in the near future, I think. So today, we're going to talk about what's really been happening behind the numbers. and. Um, Carl, is the slide up? Okay. So what you're looking at here, we've seen this lots of times before. The red line is the S&P 500, so stocks. And the blue line is the Fed, the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the BOJ, so the Bank of Japan balance sheets. And this is one of the ways that the stock market has been floating up. But what I particularly want you to see with the markets near their all-time highs is just this little bit. Remember when the markets were plunging last December a year ago? That little bit of the Fed and the central bank pivot, boy, that sure made a big change. But beyond that, the markets have been struggling. And oop, see that little upward move there? What the markets respond to? Because the central banks have promised unlimited amounts of new money. Though we know the easier and the higher quantity of new money, the less purchasing power value that it has. Somehow, though, we've been heard over and over and over again that their actions really haven't created any bubbles or any big problems, except all of a sudden, well, apparently they are a little concerned about the risk-taking based upon their behavior. So they're actually acknowledging potential, danger, potential dangers of easy money policies. I don't know about you. I've seen some very tall trees. I mean, redwoods are really tall. But they still don't grow to infinity. Nothing does. It's really simple. So what they're really doing, what the central banks are doing, is they're preparing rapidly now for the crisis. We've been watching an escalation of this trend, we've been watching the frenetic activity of the central banks of the Fed in the repo markets, which we're going to visit here in just a minute. And what we're really seeing is a lot of speeding up of self-protection. They, you know, I can't tell you that it's going to be Tuesday morning at 835, but they can't tell you that it's not going to be Tuesday morning at 835. And like me, they would rather be two weeks too early than one second too late. Because what do they really have to work with? Nothing. More of the same. You've got interest rates that when they attempted to raise them, guess what? Couldn't do it. The world is addicted to cheap money. And, and that is a good way to transfer wealth. And what's the solution? Again, more of the same. In fact, by the end of this year, which we're now in December, so within the next few weeks, debt is expected to top, just since 99, $255 trillion. And that is almost three times global economic output. 
So that is like all of the money that travels through the global economy. And it equates to $32,500 for every man, woman, and child on this planet. Now, a year ago, they were talking about most Americans having trouble pulling together $500 in case of an emergency. This year, they're talking about most Americans not being able to pull $400 together in case of an emergency. But the debt on their shoulders is way more than $32,000. That's just this little piece in here. Do you see the problem? I mean, that's half of the average income per year. Actually, a little bit more than half of that. And where has that debt gone? Because what we're hearing is how much more safe those banks are. Though don't even get me started about derivatives. That we'll talk about another day because all they've really been doing is hiding the leverage and transferring the risk. But look at this. Financial corporations are, they're hooked on debt. Their debt compo is composed of roughly, what, 50% a little bit more, closer, maybe closer to 60% of global economic output. But what's risen? Government debt and non-financial corp debt. Does that make any sense? Because they got to pay it back. At some point, you have to deal with that. You either roll it over or you pay it or you default on it. But the system's really set up just to roll it over constantly. And because the banks don't want you to know how bad off they are, well, we have the rise of the zombie companies that the Japanese banks created because if they take that loss on their books, you're going to know about it. So rather than doing that, they are allowing companies that do not make enough money to service their debt to borrow more to service that debt. That's like you constantly getting new credit cards to transfer the balance. That debt doesn't go away, but at some point, do you think it might be a problem for you? Yes, and I think that point is now. And that is that is also a big problem because of the repo market, which I'm going to show you. Today, U.S. companies account for roughly 70% of this year's total corporate defaults. And yet we're told how great everything is. Understand that in the current system that we're in, fiat money, dollars, euros, yen, yuan, doesn't matter. They are created from debt. So what you're really looking at here is a debt creation mechanism. These debts are never intended to be paid back because that would take money out of the system. They are, they are intended to just compound and roll over and roll over. But it doesn't matter whether you're a government, you're a corporation, or you're an individual. It still works the same. It's just a different scale. Governments through central banks have the ability to grow debt really without even asking you. Have you agreed to let giving all these corporations this level of debt? Because all that debt, or most of it, has been turned into financial products and sold back to you. It's crazy, we've talked about it so many times. But I just wanna stay focused here for the moment because we've also been keeping our eye on the repo markets. And I'll tell you the truth, I learned something this time. I mean, I learn things every time I do these research pieces, which is why I love them. But I learned something this time that I didn't know before, and I'm gonna share it with you, because when I saw it, my mouth dropped open. For one thing, I've been showing you right along how the risks have been transferred from the few, from the elite, to the many, to the taxpayers, to the public investors. Well, this is no shift. This is no change from that. But of particular concern is that U.S. Treasuries, which this is the bellwether market for the global markets, and the place where by issuing Treasuries, that's how our government 
funds its debts and its deficits, right? That's how they do it, by creating debt and then selling it and spending it. This is the piece. Usually in the repo markets, or I should say in the past repo markets, like in 2008, the buyers in the repo markets were primarily banks. But when the crisis hit, what the government did, what the central banks did, was they injected the, the banks with lots and lots of cash to buy the government debt, right? And that put that piece into what's called a doom loop between government funding, banks funding governments, and governments giving money to banks so they can fund governments. There's your doom loop. But since the crisis, as they've been transferring the risk, now the biggest buyers in the repo markets are other investors. Look at that. These are insurance companies, so insurance companies aren't going to the repo markets. Local governments, mutual funds, banks, foreigners, and other investors. Those other investors are leveraged investors. So they're trust, they're, cor they're corporations. So these companies that have to pay those bills on a short-term basis, right? They're corporations, they're independent broker dealers, and their hedge funds. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second to explain because all of that would be classified as hot money. Hot money can move into a market quickly and it can also move out of a market quickly. So this is a backdoor way for this Federal Reserve to fund these leverage buyers because they know that there's too much leverage in the system and if they don't provide that liquidity, it's game over right now. So they're providing it not to banks like they did back in 2008, but to these others, to hedge funds, to corporations. Well, if the corporations stop buying the treasuries, you got a problem. Now, Arguably, they could justify bailing out the banks, but are the, and even a few select corporations like AIG, the insurance company, because of the derivative bets that they had against Goldman Sachs, and even GM. They could justify that to a degree, but with the level of income inequality and the global growth of uh, rioting and and kickback that, or pushback, I should say, rather, from the population to the 1%, how palatable do you think that might be? And, oh, by the way, what are they going to do? Grow their balance sheet? Another, you know, I think right now the central bank, just those three, is at something like $14.5 trillion. They're going to do that? Can they double it? And the more they do it, the less impact that it has. But this is what you need to understand and be really clear of. Think about what backs any fiat money. And we're in the U.S., so what backs the U.S. dollar? The full faith and credit of the government. Well, let's translate those words. As long as you trust them, you have faith you will continue to loan them money, extend them credit. So the bottom line is, is that what supports the dollar is the government's ability, or any fiat money, this is true, the government's ability to continue to borrow. And now traders are the ones that are in control of what happens with our dollars. It's not even really the central banks anymore or even the banks, which are the central bank minions. It is hedge funds and broker dealers and corporations. That's who's in charge of this. And they don't really give a crap about you or me or even frankly, what the central bankers want. I should have put the VIX um, on treasuries in there. I'll bring that up the next time and we'll talk about that because you can see the transition on the volatility from what was once just a very calm market into a trading market. And that's exactly what it is. Here's the evidence of it. I should have put these two together. I will, I will, I will. You'll see what I'm talking about. 
Give me all, I'll make that happen for tomorrow. Because the Fed cannot stop pumping money into the repo markets. They cannot stop doing it. And it'll be more and more and higher. Through uh, yesterday or the day before, 12-2, they have put over 3.2, almost $3.3 trillion into these repo markets, and it didn't go to the banks. <laughs> Most of it went to those others, the hedge funds of the corporations. That's insanity. And they've also been extending out. So they had the overnight, then they had the seven day. Here you got a 28 day and a 42 day. Well, and, and here's the thing. People think if it's an overnight loan that it gets paid back the next day. But these are simply rolled over and rolled over and rolled over. And you know how you know that? Because it wouldn't have to inject 3.3 trillion into the repo markets to keep them going because they'd have that money that was paid back. So the intention is just to roll it over and roll it over and roll it over and you can do it until you can't. But because that's not enough, well, the Fed has started buying, as you know, short-term treasury bills. The difference between a bill, a note, and, the bond, and a bond is the maturity. So the bills are the short-term. And this is what they've done. In August, it was at zero. On August 14th, it was at zero. Now, they're up to, or as of November 27th, which was the most current date that I could pull on this, 100, over 106 billion. And the commitment is 60 billion a month at least. But we remember, we are in an ample reserve regime, which means just as they raised how much they're doing in the repo markets, they can do that here too. Now, a lot of people think, well, they can just do this forever, but they can't. They really can't do it forever because the more they do, the less it works and the greater the loss of confidence is. And that's the biggest threat to this whole thing. Will you lose confidence in them? I've lost confidence in them. That's why I buy gold and silver. And that's why I don't have any stocks and bonds or any of that other garbage that they're throwing out there. Now, in the future, after all this garbage is burned off, then yeah, I'll be very selective when I go in and buy companies that have the ability to survive this mess. But I'm gonna tell you, it is way too soon to do that because the mess you know, I can't tell you the exact moment, but I can tell you that I'm seeing a lot of frenetic activities underneath the surface from those that know what's going on. So that tells me we are very, very close. And the other piece, this is huge. So I hope I explain this well for you because the ECB as well as the Federal Reserve is talking about changes to their inflation target. Now, when they talk about price stability, what they're talking about is they want prices to increase 2% a year, every year, because you'll keep paying it and you won't notice that you're losing that purchasing power value. So all of this QE money, and they keep saying, we cannot hit our 2% target, which I think probably if you look at your personal experience, you know that in your day-to-day -day cost of living, well, that's really not true. There's the CPI, okay? This is since they took over. But where all of that excess money that they created went, it went into mostly fiat products and targeted reflation trade. Uh, those that have been watching for a while know that we were talking about the reflation trade because there's only one way to fight deflation and that is with inflation. Not like they have any other choices. So all that new money that was printed, most of that inflation went into your stock market, went into your bond market, and went into the real estate market and all those products and those leveraged products that were created from those three markets, as well as it's about keeping the derivatives floating. 
But what, when they're talking about changing that target, when they haven't been even able to meet it, it's because they know that they're going to have to do another massive round of QE, far bigger than even what they're doing now. And considering the, uh, the level of monetary injection that they're doing, that means way, most likely, way bigger than what they did in the midst of that crisis. So is that inflation going to just keep staying in those targets that they select? Well, some of it will, certainly some of it will. But I think that they are getting very concerned that it's going to go out into the broader economy and that inflation is not going to be at that 2%, but it's going to be fast enough for you to notice it. And what I think they're doing here is preparing you because with the ECB, they're saying, well, you know, up to this point, it was close to, but not as high as that 2% inflation target. They're going to remove that not as high as or close to and just put our target as a 2%. And the reason why they say they're going to do that is so that when they hit that target, they don't have to raise interest rates. Here, let me back up because here's the theory. If you want to stimulate the economy, you drop interest rates and that inspires people and corporations to borrow and to spend. And then that stimulates the economy. And if you need to slow that down, you raise interest rates so that corporations and individuals stop borrowing and spending. And that slows everything down. But we've had interest rates at zero for a decade now. So, you know, they pretty much have gotten whatever they're going to get out of that. And clearly, since we're entering a global recession, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. So what they're doing and with the Federal Reserve, what they're saying is they're going to let it run above that 2% target so that overall you have an average of 2%. So what does all that gobbledygook mean? Well, they're preparing us. This is my opinion based on what they're saying. And they're preparing the inflation to go a whole lot faster soon. This next big round that they do of QE, not, not the repo piece, but beyond that. And then you're going to notice it. You're not going to be happy about it, but they're going to say, oh, no, no, this is all part of our policy. And we have to do that because we've really got to try that, you know, get that 2% target, which is garbage to begin with. It's a robbery. It's a confiscation of your wealth. They just don't use those terms. And if you aren't paying attention, you might not even know. If you never look at the prices when you go to the grocery store, you aren't necessarily, you might notice that your bill's a little higher if you buy the same things, but you aren't really going to notice it. For those of us that do pay attention and, and maybe you want to share some of your experiences, we notice it and we then might lose confidence. So, you know, what are they doing? This piece is really interesting. I'm going to go through it actually pretty quickly because again, now back in 2008, right after that, you had a number of company, uh, countries, Venezuela being one in 2011 that started, well, they confiscated, but they also repatriated, which means their gold was held offshore. Typically, or frequently, I should say, rather, it's held either in the New York Federal Reserve or it's held in the Bank of England. There are some other places, too, but those would be the two main depositories where other countries will hold their gold. But what do they know? They know that possession is nine-tenths of the law. And they are very concerned that in this next global crisis, if they don't hold their gold, they ain't getting it back. So not only are they accumulating more, but they're bringing it home because it is, that is the safe haven asset bar none. And remember, that's how they do the reset. So, you know, there are a number of countries. These are just a few, Romania 
And what do they say? As you keep your jewels at home, you do not keep them at your neighbors. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. Make no mistake about it. Poland. I mean, the list goes on and on, and I should put together, and I will put together um, a, a small video. I probably won't run it like this, but I will put together so you can see how that trend has been escalating because these all happened just recently. Look at this. So that makes me kind of look and, and sit up and go, hmm, there is a shift, there is a pattern shift in there where these things are happening more rapidly, particularly in Eastern Europe that are part of the European Union. Negative rates there, can they raise those rates? They're gonna have to, I mean, there are so many people that are coming out and talking about negative rates now, they're really not gonna have a whole lot of choice about it, but they're damned if they do. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. They're darned if they do and they're darned if they don't. Just like every other central bank, they really need to raise the interest rates because the mechanism that they use, the banks, to transmit their policies to everybody else, well, they're dying on the vine. It's not just zombie uh, corporations, non-financial corporations that we have, but it's zombie banks that we have. We don't even realize it yet. But these negative rates are killing the banking system, the pension system, the insurance system, any contract that is based on a longer term guaranteed output is impacted by these low rates. So, you know, you put that on top of the pension crisis that we have globally, you know, there's a, there's a cocktail for a massive crisis. We do also know that the power has been shifting, but quite honestly, China's not really in any better shape than we are. So I'm telling you, in my personal, really strong opinion, living my life inside of all of these reports from all of these different agencies, they're scared and they're preparing for this next explosion pretty rapidly now. And will it be 2020? I, I, you know, I don't know, but it could be. Will it be 2021? Yeah, by the end of 2021, They've got to change all of those contracts from the LIBOR to whatever that new system's going to be. And it's not ready yet. And that has not been decided yet. And we only have, what, a little bit more than two years to go for that. And still, as I showed in a previous video, new contracts that are being written are still, most of them are still being written against LIBOR. We got a problem here, people. Central banks know this. They're preparing. Do you know it? Because you need to know it. And you need to tell everybody. I'm going to do my best to try and give you some tools for those people that don't want to listen. I'm redoing the 2008 was just a warning. Um, hopefully I'll have that out for you very, very soon. I'm going to make sure that it's good enough that, well, I want to make sure it's excellent. But I'm going to make sure, I'm going to do my best to make sure that it's good enough so that you can show it to somebody that has no idea what's going on, really doesn't even want to hear it, and, you know, they'll get it. I Keep your fingers crossed and just, you know, I love the suggestions that you give me to help make this better and better. So this week I... Uh, David Modell did a wonderful interview. It was really a lot of fun. I'm not quite sure if that's posted, but he said he was going to get it right out. Uh, Megan has been on vacation, but she will be back tomorrow. So uh, I don't know that she's had a chance to really pay too much attention to that, but she'll get right on it tomorrow. And if you have any questions about this or anything else, it's questions at itmtrading.com. And don't forget to visit our blog where you will find all of the links, particularly to those repos and those Fred graphs and the Federal Reserve balance sheet, you know, you can, you can take them, you can visit that as much as you want yourself, but our blog, itmtrading.com forward slash blog, you'll find all of these images as well as all of those links. 
and you know feel free to visit us and then also we are on Brighteon, so we've been uploading all of our videos there. And make sure you subscribe to us. If you like this, give us a thumbs up, hit that bell, and we'll let you know when we're going live. And keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.